Hey guys, just before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to apologize for the low level humming from the aircon and the fan. Ash and myself didn't hear it in our headphones, so we didn't think the noise was actually picked up, but when we listened to it back, we heard that there was a underlying hum the whole time. So being some of the hottest days we've had in the UK, we both had to kind of have some relief during the podcast. So we do apologize uh, before you actually get into today's episode. But it was such a cool episode that we didn't want to re-record it because the conversations were organic and they just flowed really well. And we thought you guys would really get some cool nuggets. So hope you still enjoyed today's episode and we'll catch you next week. Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift Podcast. Today we are talking about dysfunctional bodybuilding. I think in recent times in the fitness industry, functional bodybuilding has come to the fore and gained a lot of traction and there's loads of great things about it. But today we want to talk about the, I guess, when you go too far with that functional bodybuilding approach and how actually some bodybuilding practices that people are putting into their training could actually be hurting your results and making you less functional and potentially creating problems rather than solving them. So we're going to get into the weeds with that. a topic close to both of our hearts, I think, so mm. hopefully you get a lot out of it. But before we get into it, as always, a quick thank you to our show sponsors, thetrainingstimulus.com. We have upgraded the Movement Mechanics Mentorship Program. So if you're a coach, PT, or healthcare professional looking to get a next level understanding of movement and learn a detailed and structured assessment protocol to help your clients or athletes improve the way they move, please check out the website at thetrainingstimulus.com. Also to wit-fitness.com for all your wit kit. Please use our discount code LL15 to get 15% off your purchase. And Hytro for blood flow restriction apparel. Use discount code LL20 to get 20% off. Right, let's get into it. Rob, dysfunctional bodybuilding. What's that all about? Mate, I absolutely loved it. When you put these notes in and I saw the word dysfunctional bodybuilding, I said to myself, I was like, I'm going to thoroughly enjoy this episode. Because for me, I think the the functional fitness space has taken a turn and it's not necessarily the right turn for it. And this is because when you when you look at the history of say like functional training and how say like it really come to the forefront around the CrossFit era, so way back, right? So before that everyone was focused on aesthetics. We want to look good, we want to build muscles, you know, going back to the Arnold era, everyone was like, This is what training is all about. And then you had the CrossFit methodology coming in with uh, Greg Glassman. And then he said, like, nope, you need to be moving, full body, total body movements, get the most big, big, biggest bang for your buck, get the most out of it, and really start challenging yourself beyond just the way you look. And the, the way you look will then be a byproduct. So, and then you had then quite a lot of, say, high end athletes, obviously getting a bit burnt out from these total body movements because they're pushing themselves to extremes. And then throwing in bodybuilding as a way to downregulate the stress in their body and say, right, we're going to now do some bodybuilding to give me an opportunity to recover, maybe drop the intensity of some of my training. And now, because it was a taboo subject to talk about within the Mm. functional fitness space, it's now become the cool kid to talk about. And everyone's (laughs) doing the bodybuilding. Now, I'm all for bodybuilding. I love bodybuilding bodybuilding training and anyone that knows how i train strength and bodybuilding that is what i do and i like to try and throw in some functional fitness to just try and keep up with the cool kids on the block right but generally my training is strength and growth and i think when you start trying to blend it in to the functional fitness space and start saying to yourself and we can go back a good while on the podcast and i remember saying to you doing bicep curls to get better at chin-ups Mm. And I am still a slight advocate of that statement. (laughs) However, I say that because I think growing your biceps will just look good. Will that, (laughs) is that the most functional way to get better your chin ups doing hammer curls? Probably not. And I, and I've, I, I, I know that's a a silly statement to say, but I think even though I know it's a silly statement, we see it a lot online, people Mm. doing hammer curls to get better at chin ups and like, so what's your thoughts on this? <laughs> yeah, I think I like your history recap there because it's funny how the industry sort of got in this cycle where it was all bodybuilding and then it, like functional fitness came to the fore and bodybuilding always became a dirty word and a bit taboo that, mm. oh no, you shouldn't do that because it's just vain and you know, it's, it's almost more noble to pursue performance and function and not mm. care about aesthetics. And then people realize that they still actually care about yeah. how they look. So then they started <laughs> adding it in 
Um, but I think the, the issue I take with it is where it's thought about as better for your function. So mm. it's almost like if somebody's injured, they turn to bodybuilding thinking that that's a better way to train the body so that they're not injured when injury is essentially a performance problem, not an aesthetic problem. Yeah. So why are you doing aesthetic focused training to solve a performance related issue? And I think we were talking about it earlier. I think I'm going to jump into one of my favorite analogies of if you think about how the body moves, it moves as a whole system and we are like one big chain of bones, joints and muscles. And when we're doing big compound movements that replicate the way our body actually wants to move, we're training all of those muscles at the same time and we're training them in pretty good proportions for who's doing how much work if the movement is performed well. And when we're doing like single joint isolation exercises, we're training one link in the chain and that can be good and that can be nice to have bigger, better looking biceps, for example. But if we're building extra strong or developed links in the chain, we're actually building comparative weakness because the neighboring links mm. will not be getting as much stimulation and will not be leveling up in the same way. And this, I have seen this sort of training leads to more imbalance. So say you're looking at a chain, like a compound movement, like the pull up. If all you did was bicep curls, you're actually training the body to want to use the smaller muscles yeah. to do more of the work, which is dysfunctional. So if you're looking to do a pull-up, obviously you want the bigger, stronger muscles doing most of the work. And things like the lats should be very much doing a huge proportion of, of that movement. However, if you're constantly reinforcing the signal to your body that the biceps are the main pulling muscle, you will actually reduce the capacity of your other muscles because they think that any sort of elbow flexion is linked to just biceps and in bodybuilding movements the whole concept of isolation is that you're trying to tweak out other muscles so yeah. if you're doing say preacher curls or something you're literally trying to create a setup so that only the bicep can do the work so this strong link of the bicep now creates relative weakness or relative uh, relatively weaker recruitment in other muscles so when you do come to your compound movements you've actually trained them to train the pattern to be less functional than had you trained them all together and that's not to say there aren't situations where more emphasis on an individual muscle can be a good idea for example if you have an imbalance that you need to undo so you could mm -hmm. do a lat an extra lat dominant pull up to undo that um that bicep imbalance but i think presenting the bicep curls as something that's a good idea as an accessory for your pull-ups for everybody isn't actually accurate. Yeah, so I think just on this, I feel using obviously the bicep curl is, that's just because I like to use bicep curls as all examples. Arm. Yeah, they're very close to my heart. But the when I think about like say, to improve your pull-up, I'd be a lot more I'm a lot more of an advocate for obviously if you're going down the bodybuilding route to go to say a lat pull down because then you're starting to understand motor control of how to essentially put in that motion not saying because obviously it's you're doing the opposites because you're secured into something but if you're someone that's trying to learn maybe scapular movement the ability yeah. to pull through the elbows a lat pull down is an awesome exercise to kind of give you an idea of how to fire the sequence because yep. again you're not then isolating your bicep you're not isolating your lats you're working together kind of and yep. with a cable is great because you've got a nice continuous tension going through it now then that can progress to say a self-assisted pull-up where you're then actually using your body to do that same sequencing so you've kind of built up that connection through a bodybuilding exercise say lat pull down and then mm -hmm. taking it into then a body weight version of the end goal of being a full pull-up now i think one of the most important thing uh, points that we would need to kind of get across here today is also the idea of the single joint isolation part that's i think that yeah. this is kind of the the point that we're hammering to you guys is they're the ones that we need to be most conscious of performing to improve the main lift of whatever your chosen thing yeah. and one of the one of the points that I think is important to, that we discussed just off air was one where we started talking about the rotator cuff 
Mm. And there's a lot of talk at the moment because we're like the knees over toe guy and stuff like that. And we're doing like heavy, like rotator cuff exercises. And for me, it's really funny because going to the point that you said just before is if we're building this really big rotator cuff, it can't physically have the room to rotate in a snatch. So if you're doing a rotator cuff and you're trying to really hypertrophy that muscle, build it up really big. Imagine, right, you've got these tiny little muscles in your shoulder that you're building up massive and you're not actually building up your shoulder strength. And, and because remember, the rotator cuff is to stabilize the shoulder, like as part of that structure there. So building up the stability side stuff doesn't necessarily mean you have more stability because you have to get it into this position. And I think this is in where, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing these rotator cuff exercises, but I think understanding the why of what you're doing and is it the best best uh, choice, uh, best use of your time? Because that's yeah. what most of us are struggling on, right? Time. And if, yeah. if you're doing these rotator cuff exercises, is that the answer on even bicep curls is bicep curls really appropriate for you if you're trying to be functionally fit yeah yeah spot on and i think the, the key distinction there for the rotator cuff is what are the prime movers of the movement that you're working on are you working on snatch you're working on pressing and i remember a while ago we did an episode on identifying your limiter so if mm. we think about something like a strict press or a snatch big compound movements that use loads and loads of different muscles at the same time in a big coordinated sequence so for it to be a good decision to do just exercises that just strengthen the rotator cuff we need to be sure that the rotator cuff is the weak link in the chain so that's to say the thing that's stopping you putting more weight onto a strict press on your snatch is your rotator cuff and only in that situation does it really make sense for you to be strengthening that link in your chain but if that movement pattern is working well, you're continually able to add weight, there's no niggles, no injuries, your um, the move, movement's looking good, and there's no suggestion that your rotator cuff is that link that's holding back your progress. Why would you train it out of proportion with everything mm. else? Because doing the movement itself in a good, like with good form in air quotes, means that you are training the muscles in good proportion so it will level up with everything else as well because it will be getting worked so i would encourage you to just focus on doing the movement well and then if you're plateauing if you're experiencing a niggle do a little bit of diagnostic to figure out where is the limiter and all we, like we talk about this all the time make sure the big rocks are in the jar first so mm. are your major prime movers doing what they should be doing and if they're not, then you can dig a little bit deeper to see if the, the smaller stabilizing muscles are dysfunctional. But unless they are, it's kind of, you're trying to predict the yeah. weak link before you've you figured out why. And I think that joint by joint, muscle by muscle approach is a, it's kind of a, a deep rabbit hole you can go down and you're almost trying to strengthen, yeah, strengthen each individual link when it's easier in and the most more efficient in inefficient way yeah. <laughs> exactly right yeah and we we're talking about it offline as well i think i like to use the analogy of the body as a, a football team and if you're training a small stabilizing muscle as if it's the star of the show and the prime mover it's the analogy i came up with was it's like training your center back or your goalkeeper to shoot and score like like three headers <laughs> off a, a cross you're basically encouraging that player to do a job that isn't his job yeah. and it actually leads to dysfunction in the team. Like, yeah, because then there's a massive hole in the defence yeah. because he's up front exactly. trying to score a goal. It's like, no, 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 that was for the one-off that you should, exactly. which is just like when you put that into training where the rotator cuff had to work a little bit harder because the bar went a little bit further back than it should have. But that's in a movement mechanics issue, not a rotator cuff issue. It's just had to work. And then if you've injured your rotator cuff in that thing, it's not the rotator cuff was weak. You just pushed it to its limits. And yeah. it's, a, a, it's the identifying the issue. And I think what I love there is in what you're saying is understanding how far you need to regress the movement itself to keep it as close to the movement. Like for most things, you do not need to regress it to back down to the single joint issue like you just don't you do not need to do a bicep curl to build a bigger chin up and yeah. i'm going to be the first one to admit that i understand that. <laughs> yeah. i might like to but i understand it 
So yeah. when you're honest with yourself as in why you're choosing to do these things, and I think that also then begs the question of understand why are you training? Because mm -hmm. when you ask yourself, cool, I want to be fit, I want to look good and stuff like that, then that's completely fine. But make sure your programming reflects those requirements and understand that you're doing, say, some dumbbell chest flies because you want to build your chest. You're not yeah. doing it necessarily to improve your burpees. You're doing it because you want a bigger chest. Yeah. It's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. they're the sort of things, that, the, the honesty, and it's nothing, it's, it's because it's still now, like, it's getting less, but it's still a taboo to say you just want to look good in the functional yeah. world. And I think yeah. that's where then obviously the functional body movement takes a bit of a, or needs to be kind of reflected upon because it's now being used to improve full body performance and this is kind of the issue where we're, we're seeing because then injuries are a lot more common because you you think you're bulletproof in your body, but in the long run you're actually not because you're as like when you said there you're making this what you thought was a weak link into a super link. So now it's doing everything. So would you want to do a strict press with your rotator cuff? No, you want to do a strict press with your shoulders, your lats and stuff. You want to get that full body working in a movement to press through and use your lats to stabilize, not your rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is for yeah. the, the, that's your seat belt, <laughs> the, yeah. just in case. Exactly. And I think um, one thing that needs to be said is this concept of like, if you're doing an exercise just for your rotator cuff, why would you train your rotator cuff out of sequence with the other muscles, you can still get rotator cuff stimulation doing the main movement, or even just a slightly adjusted version of the main movement to what we call like it's integrated isolation in that we are emphasizing more rotator cuff work if we've identified that that's something yeah. that's necessary in a more compound movement so that the sequencing can benefit. And this would be something like a, even like a muscle snatch, you're mm. using your rotator cuff more in a muscle snatch for that turnover than you would do in a full snatch where as it passes that point of the lift, you know, the work's basically done in a, in a full snatch. Whereas in a muscle snatch, you really have to work that yeah. external rotation of the shoulder and on the way down as well, you'll get lengthening through the rotator cuff. So those sorts of variations actually have more of a bulletproofing effect yeah. because you're building very specific resilience to the movements that you've chosen. Um, whilst still giving those, like air quotes, weaker links <laughs> yeah. more stimulation than they would otherwise get. I think this is really apparent because when you then look into the weightlifting world and you watch a snatch warm up, they go mm. through bar like bar going through the positions and they start off nearly always with muscle snatches, then into power snatches and getting all drop snatches. So you're you're progressing the movement and essentially you're warming up your rotator cuff through a muscle snatch and then you're turning that then you're warming it up in a powerful way with a controlled say power snatch or a drop snatch so you're going through all these progressions until you actually get to the full snatch i think yeah. again it kind of gets blurred because there is so much demand it's like in crossfit that it's just like what are you warming up and it, this is yeah. why you can where i know obviously with, through the movement mechanics stuff like taking things to say lunges and squats and doing movements as part of that where the full body works as one because when you then go in into your full body movements you can then target in such a way where you have these weaknesses they say like a hip shift or whatever you're then doing a specific lunge or squat to target that hip shift to warm up your main lift rather than doing say a clam a banded clam because that's then taking you so far away from say the squat Whereas if you did a lunge with a with a twist or whatever, that that's going to then start to target that part of the glute that needed to have a little bit more awareness ready for the main lift. So when you get to the main lift, you're doing your thing properly. Yeah, exactly. And it's teaching it to do its job in conjunction with in a chain. Else. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it. And I think to sort of to zoom out a little bit in terms of like how this all fits into the, the wider context of functional fitness training is that I think there's a lot of people trying to do the right things and trying to bulletproof the body and we're not challenging the thought process enough because you know if you are training functionally and trying to build a bulletproof body you should be the least injured population really mm. that, that's kind of yeah. one of the reasons to do that style of training but 
it just doesn't seem like that's coming true. And there's a lot of people who I think are getting very frustrated because they think they're doing all the right things, but aren't quite getting what they thought from it. And I think it's because we don't challenge the assumptions that go behind some of these programming decisions where, you know, saying, yeah, do your, do your rotator cuff exercises because that's what bulletproofs your shoulders. Is that actually true? Mm. Like, is that the reality of how the body works? And um, I think a bit of healthy debate in those areas would yeah. actually result in everybody benefiting and um, being less injured. I think this, you could kind of even like say this goes to like the instant gratification and the delay gratification stuff. Because when you, when you start thinking about like why people are getting more and more injured, and even though they're thinking they're getting bulletproof, they're bulletproofing themselves with movements, is just because intensity comes too quickly for what they have the capacity to do. So they, and this comes from, I can talk about this from experience, is in like, I actually was doing a workout the other day. And so before I got into the, the, the workout itself, I was doing some bar muscle ups. Now I've done bar muscle ups in a while. So I'd done some bar muscle ups and I was like, do you know what? It is not the right time for me to be putting bar muscle ups into a workout under intensity in any way, shape, or form. Now, old me. We'll be like, fuck yeah, it, I'm going to do it. But I took that <laughs> because I knew if I did that, I'd get through the workout. I'd probably do it. I'd suffer and get to some really ugly reps. But I was just like, this is not the time for me to do bar muscle ups under intensity just yet. I, and I could probably do it in, say, a couple of weeks. Fine. But right now, I made that decision because I was like, it just isn't there. So having the idea of dropping the intensity... And actually, I then scaled it right back, but I dropped the intensity to make sure that I had the, the focus of the session was the intensity, not necessarily the high skill gymnastics. The high skill gymnastics was the end product that it would be ideal if you could do. But if you can't do that, scale it down to what you're currently able to do. But we're all looking at the bar muscle up and saying we need to do the bar muscle up. And that's the yeah. same as within any CrossFit class, right? Is in this is the problem with prescribed. When people see like this is what we want everyone doing, which is great, but then everyone wants to get there and they want to get there as quickly as possible. It's like, but you need to build up the tolerance and the, the tissue tolerance to be able to then put that load under intensity. Mm. And this is where we, like, you know, where then people start doing functional bodybuilding, say, to say improve their tissue tolerance, but you're doing it in an isolated way that's then not actually going to really help the bar muscle up because it's ideally through say the bar muscle up there's not really one part constantly taking a load of stress the idea is you're doing a fluid motion so that you're yep. barely using anything that it's a nice cyclical motion and the body works as one unit not yep. in individual parts so it's I, I just feel because we add intensity so quickly into training the reason why i liked bodybuilding was because it dropped away some of that intensity and it made mm. people actually start to get a better mind muscle connection actually understand what their body's doing this is kind of my where i do feel everyone should do a form of bodybuilding because to understand what your bicep feels like when it contracts to understand mm. what it feels like when your back contracts but when you're doing a big body weight movement or you're doing a move a total body movement it's really hard to feel these uh, like what your body's doing yeah we well, don't want to be firing them one by one no sort of thing you, in the muscle you, up. you, you don't you, want to be just firing your bicep you don't want to be just firing your lats it's no kind of a full body connected but movement. for me the reason why i say that that is a, yeah you're supposed to use your full body but understanding what it feels like for all these muscles to work as one. Well. so then when i'm coaching you and i say you need to get more lats in that pull because you're just pulling you kind of understand a straight arm pull down what it feels yeah. like to contract your lats so you you have a better understanding of what the body needs to do and because yep. it's it's amazing how little body awareness people have, let alone what muscles are like. If I say to lats to someone, most people are like, what is that? Is that on my arm? Is that my chest? Yeah. Like, well, they don't understand these things, which is completely fine. It's not for them to understand. But when you're then doing, say, a lat pull down a row, and you're being able to go touch points and think, like, this is what you're supposed to be feeling contract. These are the movements. It's for me. That's where bodybuilding within the functional world has a place. But it's not necessarily to improve the muscle up. It's maybe for a better mind yeah. muscle connection, which will then help when I'm, say, trying to coach you a full body movement. Just my opinion, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, I aspire to be more um, purist on that front to say, to, fo to have a really big focus on external cues and achieving tasks outside of your body rather than focusing yeah. internally on individual muscles and that's that's 
like I say, very purist, functional, sort of sport, almost sport-based rather mm-hmm. than gym-based. Um, but I did want to double down on what you were saying earlier about the muscle-ups. First of all, who are you and what have you done with red line? Yeah, I know, I know. A very, a very uh, mature decision <laughs> that I'm pleased you made for yourself. But I think the question that comes out of that, um, that story there is what should you be doing to build up your tissue tolerance to be able to handle muscle-ups? And I think this is where CrossFit is very good, especially the classes where progressions are offered. Mm. So if you can't do muscle-ups under fatigue, you can create a similar stimulus if it's jumping muscle ups, if it's, you know, foot supported muscle ups. So you try to recreate the movement as closely as possible. And that mirrors the proportional loading yeah. to different tissues. It gets the same muscle sequencing as close as we can so that you get that same stimulus just watered down to a level where you can actually execute the movement well and you can actually stress the tissues in exactly the same way, just to a lesser degree. So you can still participate in the same workout, you still get the same stimulus, but at a level you can handle and in a movement pattern that will hold up under fatigue. Because I think that's the the question that naturally comes like, oh, if that's not what I do to Bulletproof, then what do I do? And the general principle here is trying to mirror the movement pattern as closely as possible so that you get the same kinds of load through the same parts of your body. So if you're looking to condition your body for pull-ups, then sort of like other sorts of pulling, trying to replicate the direction of gravity, trying to replicate the movement pattern and the positions you find yourself in. This is why ring rows are so often prescribed to help people improve their pull-ups. If you're looking to bulletproof your knee do, in squatting, doing squat-like movements like split squats or lunges, mm. they are recreating the same movement patterns and stressing the tissues in a very similar way, but likely with um, not so much load or not so much intensity, which is what led to the overuse or the, the injury in the first place, rather than trying to pick apart, you know, one calf muscle, one mm-hmm. tib anterior, one one head of the quad. Like it's so difficult to know that that is the limiting part of your squat that's holding back your squat performance. Whereas you've got so much more chance of covering off all those players in the team by doing another compound movement, just with a slightly different emphasis. Yeah. And again, like say using the squat as the example, say you want to be a bit more, say, VMO slash knee dominant, having your heel raised and having a tall torso like the knees over toe guy likes to promote is a great way for keeping the movement as close to the compound as possible. Or you can even then regress that to his uh, knees over toe split squat. So that again, yep. staying close to the movements themselves to improve the main, um, the main goal. And like, but again, I think all of this for me, as we've been discussing it more and more, it, it really boils down to understanding the intensity needed and understanding the intensity that you should be working at to then understand what scale of the movement you're doing. And using my muscle up example is in like, I knew to get the intensity that was being asked for. A muscle up was not the answer to that. So I had to scale it right back down to say pull ups because mm-hmm. I knew that was a that was a movement that was say close enough to a muscle up, but building up that tolerance so that keep in motion and that sort of thing. And I was able to maintain intensity because it wasn't up the chain in the high skill level. So I wasn't at the top with bar muscle up. I was then down towards pull ups for me, which I knew that was my level for the day. So I was then using that. So I understood the intensity that I, so basically the intent of the training, I had a clear understanding of, and I made the right call for that. And I think this is then where, and and linking it right back to the dysfunctional bodybuilding stuff is because it's, I think it's very unclear sometimes, like why you're doing certain movements and you, because you you think they're the answer, not actually understanding what they're actually doing. Exactly. And I think if you're in your situation there, if you want to go from doing pull-ups in that workout to doing muscle-ups in that workout, the answer is not isolated single joint exercises. No. The answer is muscle-up progressions, yes. potentially with fatigue. So how can you recreate that muscle-up movement pattern and stress on the body at a level that you can hold with good form under fatigue? Mm. And that's the question you're asking, not yeah. like what single tissue in my body needs to be more robust so that I can manage muscle ups 
in a workout. It's yeah. not. That's not. The so I need better lockouts. So I'm going to do some tricep extensions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or some tricep exactly. kickbacks. It's like yeah. that's not what we're doing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's a really good example. And I think people do think like that. Whereas actually, doing some straight bar dips, of mm. like mimicking a bar muscle up would work on that part of the muscle up in exactly the yep. same way that you would be getting lockout in the bar muscle up. So it's actually simpler in my mind in that you just think, right, how can I adapt a muscle up to emphasize the weak point rather than um, think of a completely separate exercise to work on it in an abstract situation. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think we need to understand that if you are trying to prioritize joint health then you need to move your joints in the motion that we're trying to do. That's what, we've been, as we just said there with the muscle up, you're trying to keep it as close to the movement as possible. So the further away from the movement you go, the less likely it's going to have a direct correlation of improvement. And that's where I think we need to start becoming very clear on the intended stimulus of the chosen exercise and why you're doing it. If you're doing it for aesthetics, sweet crack on do your thing get a sweet pump but yep. if you're doing it to try to improve say muscle ups using say the tricep kickback as an example that is not your answer to improve say elbow health to improve muscle ups is no no you need to scale that muscle up to the appropriate scale that you can then perform at intensity exactly that's a really good point and it basically boils down to like tissue tolerance is best trained specifically rather than piecemeal mm. and um yeah i think that's 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 essentially it and a lot of these bodybuilding movements like the single joint isolation exercises are deliberately trying not to allow the connective tissues to interfere with the the set so yeah. in in a preacher curl or another bicep isolating exercises you don't want to be stressing the tendons or the ligaments you want the whole focus of that exercise is to stress the muscle tissue whereas to have good function we want our connective tissue to be leveling up in parallel with our muscular force generation so recreating the stress on the connective tissue to give it an amount of stress and stimulus to develop we want bigger thicker stronger tendons as well as bigger thicker stronger muscles so why would we take them out of our training and build that comparative weak link in the chain. Yeah, and I think it's just be honest with yourself, bodybuilding is sweet, like bodybuilding is yeah. completely fine. And if you're doing it, do it and own it. Like there is nothing wrong with this. And it's like, I know like commercial gyms get ba uh, bashed on within the functional world and vice versa. Like, you know, the, ev everyone has to be on a certain side of the fence. And I think where, where we're all trying to be is meet somewhere in the middle but kind of have uh, like understand what parts from each area that we want to start to take and understand that if yep. we just want to focus on some size and hype and growth, then do that. Like don't kid yourself. Yep. You're trying to get better at a push press by doing an Arnold press. Like, no, no, just stick as close to that as possible. And I just think it's about being honest with yourself. I really do. A lot of this boils down to that because it's, because because what we see and when we see a lot of these like high profile people say performing um, functional bodybuilding as they, as as you class it, they've had a whole training history of building all these tissue tolerances and stuff like that. They've done so much. They've created such a strong foundation that all they're doing at the moment now is maintaining their physique, not necessarily building it to improve in their functional fitness space. They're just now maintaining it and probably, if anything, a little less functional because, yep. <laughs> because they're doing these bodybuilding movements. And that's, that's completely fine. But as you get older, you start to realize that actually i just want to look good and move well like that is what it is and really i might actually not need to do as much as i thought i needed to yeah yeah i think you said it all there that there's absolutely nothing wrong with having aesthetic goals and something we keep saying throughout all the podcasts is the more clear you are on what your training balance is mm. like how much do you care about performance how much do you care about function how much do you care about aesthetics if you know what those relative importances are, then everything, all the decisions get made for you. But the confusion comes where you're trying to use bodybuilding to bulletproof yourself and mm. you're actually achieving neither really. So I think that's the, uh, 
that's the sum some nice. takeaway there beautiful anything else to add are you sweet i think i am sweet good you good mean? right well i'm gonna go off and get sweet pump now so i'm gonna go and do some bodybuilding <laughs> and i'm gonna be completely honest about it. it's a friday um so guys we really hope you enjoy today's episode and you you took away our our points i know we kind of kind of hammered home on pretty much the same point throughout the episode but we tried to say it in many different ways to hopefully apply to you and your situation because you know at the end of the day bodybuilding is great you're building your body and but understand what you're doing it for so we hope you enjoyed it if you did do share it with others maybe tag some people that you might think need to listen to this or you know tag us when, when you're sharing the episode that'd be really good spread the message we're really appreciating our current growth it is definitely growing at a really cool rate so we thank you very much for sharing and you know um, getting the message out there if you did enjoy it don't forget to leave a review you can head over to youtube and subscribe and uh, as always we look forward to talking to you next week so see you then. Cheers, guys.